be addressing those issues today. And <clears throat> the first batter up to play to the plate here is Dr. Andy Woods. Dr. Andy Woods got his PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. <clears throat> he is an author and speaker in this area of eschatology, senior pastor of Sugarland Bible Church, fantastic church if you're ever out there in the Houston area, and <clears throat> uh, also the president of Chafer Theological Seminary, fine seminary out there that we want to recommend to you. And so he is a fine speaker and an author. I'm sure he'll tell you about some of his books that he's written on this topic. So he's an author and scholar in the area of eschatology. And so we're happy uh, he's our guest here and he's going to be talking about who is the Antichrist. So we want to thank you for joining us from wherever you are, internationally from the Philippines. It's probably good morning out there. <laughs> for those of you from the West Coast and California, uh, it's probably uh, good afternoon or good evening. And those of you in Hawaii, you know, <clears throat> it's about lunchtime. So Without any further ado, we want to welcome uh, Dr. Andy Woods. Welcome, Andy. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Hope you can hear me okay. Good to be here. No. Can you hear me? Let's see. Ask if he can hear you. Can, can you hear you, me? Can you hear me all right? We can hear you, Andy. Okay, very good. Um, how does the PowerPoint come up? Do you want it up now? Yeah, please. Okay, so we're going to get the screen. There we go. And just hit show, uh, show movie. You got to hit view up there. There you go. All right, y'all. Well, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, it's good to be here. Can you up the volume a little bit? Okay. Um, what I'd like to uh, do in this particular session is I would just like to ask and answer the question, uh, who is the coming world ruler? And so what I'd like to share with you really are um, 10 characteristics, if you will, of the coming world ruler. And when I mean the coming world ruler, um, I'm talking about the coming antichrist. And it's sort of interesting that when you go to uh, websites or you Google the name Antichrist and you, you Google the name Donald Trump, uh, it's sort of stunning to see how many people are online trying to argue that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. And let me kind of start with this quote here from Irenaeus, uh, who was a very early church father. And he writes this, he says, if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly, that would be the Antichrist. At the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse. For it, that's the apocalypse, was seen not long ago, but almost in our own time at the end of the reign of Domitian. And it's interesting that Irenaeus is one generation removed from John. So the chain of custody goes from John, who wrote the Apocalypse, to a guy named Polycarp, early church father, and then to Irenaeus. So this is a very early writing. It goes back to about A.D., probably 180 or so. And Irenaeus here is basically saying, um, hey, stop guessing who the Antichrist is. <laughs> People were apparently doing it back in his day. If you were supposed to know who the Antichrist is, John would have given you his name. And something to keep in mind is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, which talks about a restrainer. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 talks about a restrainer. Verses 6 and 7 talks about a restrainer after it mentions the lawless one, verse 3. And it talks there about how something is restraining the man of lawlessness. And it says there in verses 6 and 7, you know what restrains him now uh, at this present time, then he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, except him who now restrains him 
will do so until he is taken out of the way. And I think that's why Irenaeus said, stop trying to guess who the Antichrist is. You can't know who the Antichrist is as long as the restrainer is in the earth. And sort of to make a long story short, I, I think the restrainer is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. So as long as the church is present, we actually cannot know who the Antichrist is. And so all of this sort of talk about, is it Donald Trump? Is it this person? Is it that, that person? That's sort of a waste of our time because by divine design, we can't know who the Antichrist is until the restrainer is removed. In other words, we can't know who the Antichrist is until the church is removed from the earth uh, via the rapture. But at the same time, there is in the Bible an awful lot of information about the Antichrist. And so what I'd like to walk you through in this particular session are 10 characteristics of the coming Antichrist. And as we do this, I'll try to interact with the question why I don't think that the, the Antichrist as many people apparently on the internet think, they think the Antichrist is Donald Trump. I'll try to show you why that is not the case from the biblical data that we have. And even let's assume hypothetically the Antichrist is Donald Trump, um, we still couldn't know who the Antichrist is as long as the restrainer is present. And so there are a lot of better things we can do with our time than trying to you know, pin the tail on the Antichrist. But let me walk you through these 10 characteristics, because one of these days the restrainer will be removed, the rapture of the church will have taken place, and the Bible does predict a man coming forward that the scripture refers to by many names, but one of his dominant names is the Antichrist. So when he comes, what is he going to be like? The first of 10 characteristics is number one, he is going to be an individual. In other words, he's going to be a human being. And that's important because a lot of people think the Antichrist is simply a system, an impersonal religious system. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, he will head up a religious system, but that system will be epitomized in an actual human being that was just as flesh and blood as was Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. So we have several scriptures to look at, and I'm kind of grabbing data for this from three areas of the Bible. One of them is Daniel 7. The second one area is 2 Thessalonians 2. And then the third area is Revelation chapter uh, 13. So we're sort of taking those areas, combining, combining them all together, trying to get some biblical clarification on who this man is, this coming Antichrist. So number one, he is going to be a human being. And notice, if you will, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice, if you will, verse 3. It says, let no one deceive you in any way. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And then it says, and the man, that's the Greek word anthropos, the man of lawlessness is revealed. So notice that he is a man, according to what Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And he will be associated with a number. We're going to talk about that number a little bit later. But in Revelation 13, verse 18, it says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. And it says, for the number is that of a man. That's our same Greek word, anthropos. And his number is 666. So very clearly, the Antichrist is an actual man. He is or will be when he shows up an actual human being. He's a human being with a soul, and we know that he has a soul because in Revelation 19 and verse 20, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. And a thousand years later, he will still be in the lake of fire when Satan joins him 
at the end of the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, that's the antichrist, and the false prophet are also. So notice that the beast or the antichrist is still in the lake of fire a thousand years later after Jesus throws him in there when he returns in Revelation 19. So the Antichrist did not get annihilated. He did not self-destruct or destruct as a religious system would have because he has a soul. And that's our first characteristic of this coming Antichrist is he will be a human being. He will be a man. Number two, he will be a Gentile. Uh, he won't be Jewish. Notice Revelation 13, verse 1, John says, Then I saw a beast, that's the Antichrist, coming out of the sea. Now, what is the sea in the book of Revelation? The sea in the book of Revelation typically represents the great Gentile mass of humanity. Revelation 17, verse 15 says, The waters, or the sea, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Isaiah 57, verse 20 says, But the wicked, Gentiles, in other words, are like the tossing of the sea. So when it describes him coming out of the sea, it's describing someone coming out of the great mass of Gentile humanity, meaning the Antichrist will be a non-Jew, he will be a Gentile. And in the scripture, there are several prefigurements, if you will, of this coming Antichrist. One of them is Titus of Rome, Daniel 9, verse 26. Another one is a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, Daniel 11, verses 30 and 31. Those are clear prefigurements that the Holy Spirit has given us of this coming Antichrist. And we know that this coming Antichrist will be Gentile because all of the prefigurements of him were non-Jewish Gentiles. In fact, the Antichrist is actually going to end a period of time called the times of the Gentiles. Um, he will conclude that time period. It's a time period really spoken of by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. And so since he ends that time period, it's very clear that the Antichrist himself will be a Gentile. Now his assistant, he will work with an assistant called the false prophet. You'll see the false prophet described beginning in Revelation 13 verse 11, going all the way through the end of the chapter. The false prophet, on the other hand, comes up out of the land or the earth. And that Greek word for earth or land is typically used to describe the land of Israel. And so I believe that the false prophet will be Jewish, but the Antichrist himself will be a Gentile. So he will, number one, be a Gentile. Number two, he will be a man. And let's move on to our third characteristic if we could, of this coming Antichrist. Number three, he will be a, I believe, a European. Uh, he will be someone of Roman uh, descent. And notice, if you will, Daniel chapter 9, and notice, if you will, verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, tells us what this coming one will do. It says, he will make a firm covenant with the many, that's Israel, for one week. And most people take that to be a reference to the work of the future uh, Antichrist. And one of the great gr uh, rules of grammar that you follow when you try to study the scripture in its original languages is you try to ask yourself, well, who is the nearest antecedent? The nearest antecedent to a pronoun tells you what the pronoun is referring to. And when you back up into that passage and go back to Daniel 9, verse 26, which comes before Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you see that the nearest antecedent is the prince who is to come, 
who will destroy the city and the sanctuary, which is a reference to what Titus of Rome did to the land of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem, and to the temple in the just a little after the time of Christ in A.D. Uh, 70. And so the nearest antecedent to this coming he is an individual named Titus of Rome, who was Roman and therefore Romish and therefore European. And so it stands to reason that this coming Antichrist will also be uh, someone from Europe, someone arising out of the cultural inheritance of the ancient Roman Empire. And to my mind, that would negate Donald Trump being the Antichrist because <laughs> last time I checked, Donald Trump is not a Roman European. But that's another characteristic of this coming Antichrist. The fourth characteristic I would share with you of this coming Antichrist is he will be a man of lawlessness. In fact, that's what the scripture refers to him as, the lawless one. Notice, if you will, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. And so there I have the Greek word in brackets for lawlessness. It's ah, which is a negation to namas, law, meaning against the law, or he, he will show no regard for the law. So anything that's legal, anything that God himself has ordained in terms of a law, he will try to erase. You have a similar description of him there in the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 25, where it says he, that's the Antichrist, will make alterations in times and in law. So he will be a man of lawlessness where he will try to erase law, particularly Judeo-Christian law, law coming from the Ten Commandments of God. And that's a great description of this coming man called the Antichrist. He will be lawless. He will negate the law. Now, again, let's apply that criterion to Donald Trump. Donald Trump in the last election cycle ran on law and order. That was one of his uh, campaign slogans, one of his great campaign themes. So how could Donald Trump be the Antichrist when Donald Trump is running on law and order and we're specifically told that this coming Antichrist will be a man of lawlessness? So you notice what I'm doing. I'm just going through these 10 characteristics to give us a biblical understanding of the coming Antichrist and trying to sort of interact with the thesis that I think is mistaken that many people are advocating that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. Let me take you, if I could, to a fifth characteristic of this coming Antichrist. The Bible is very clear that the coming Antichrist will be a great persecutor of God's people. Notice, if you will, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and notice, if you will, verse 7. It says of this coming Antichrist, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. You have the similar description in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 25, where it says of this coming Antichrist, he will speak out against the Most High. And it says there in Daniel 7, verse 25, he will wear down the saints of the highest one. So the Antichrist is someone that will persecute Christians. Uh, he will persecute God's people. Now, you'll notice that in these verses, Revelation 13, verse 7, and Daniel 7, verse 25, it specifically says that he will declare war on the saints. It never says he will declare war on the church, even though John in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation is very good at using the word church. It's the Greek word ekklesia, 
It's used about 19 times in the first three chapters. But you'll notice that John never uses the word church. Once you get into an actual description of the tribulation period, the word church is never used. Why is that? Well, we believe that the church will have been raptured into heaven and will escape this persecution of God's people that the Antichrist will unleash. You say, well, if the church is gone, who are these saints? Well, these are people that are converted in the tribulation period after the church age or the body of Christ is uh, in heaven. Now, what's interesting is the word saints that's used here. Yes, sometimes the word saints describes the church, but the word saints has always been used as a description of God's people long before the church ever existed. So you'll notice here in Psalm 50 and verse 5, God's people are called saints. That's long before the church existed. And you'll notice in Psalm 149 verse 1 that God's people again are called saints. That's long before the church existed. And so the word saints in and of itself doesn't describe the church. And I think the saints being persecuted in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 is not so much a description of the Antichrist persecuting the church, but persecuting converts after the church has already been removed from the earth via the rapture. Jesus made this interesting statement in Matthew 16, Verse 18, he said, the gates of Hades concerning the church that he would build will not overpower the church. He said, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build. Notice the future tense there. So the church didn't exist at the time Christ made that statement. The church is actually something that would be birthed on the day of Pentecost. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not uh, overpower it. So Christ made a very specific promise to the church that the church would not be overpowered, and yet Revelation 13 verse 7 describes the beast making war with the saints. Daniel 7 verse 25 describes the beast wearing down the saints and overpowering the saints. So I just have a difficult time believing that that's a description of the church when Jesus says the gates of Hades will not overpower the church. Now, again, let's compare this piece of criterion to Donald Trump. I mean, is that what Donald Trump is doing? Is he wearing down the saints? Is he persecuting the saints? No, on the contrary, at least in North America, he's given the the saints or the church a reprieve. In fact, we just had a Supreme Court case that came out uh, a week or two ago, giving the church freedom in the midst of all of these coronavirus regulations and knockdowns. And it was Donald Trump's appointees to the United States Supreme Court that rendered that decision. So again, uh, The Antichrist, when he comes, will persecute the saints. It certainly doesn't sound like Donald Trump there. Let's let's go to a sixth uh, characteristic, if we could, of this coming Antichrist. Number six, the Antichrist, when he comes, will be a globalist. Another way of saying that is he will be a one-worlder. Uh, He will not be somebody who puts nation first. He will be someone who puts the concerns of the world first, above and beyond that of his individual nation. And you see a description of this in many passages. Daniel 7 verse 23 describes it that way. Revelation 13 verses 7 and 8 describes the globalist reach of the Antichrist that way, as does Revelation 17 verse 15. Revelation 17 verse 15 that we read a little bit earlier, describing the Antichrist's influence, says the waters which you saw where the harlot sits 
are people's nations, multitudes, and tongues. That's a worldwide reach. That Those same terms, nations, tongues, peoples, and tribes, that's the same uh, description in Revelation 5, verse 9, of those for whom Christ died. Christ died for the whole world. And so by way of parallel, the Antichrist's reach, as those same terms are used in Revelation 17, verse 15, will reach into the entire world. Notice Daniel 7, verse 23, where it says that the Antichrist empire will devour, Daniel 7, verse 23, the whole earth. That's a one-world globalist uh, reach. You see the same thing in Revelation 13 and verses 16 and 17. It says he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or forehead so that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you'll notice those coupling of opposites there, the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the free and the slave. That's covering every everybody on planet Earth. And during the Antichrist reign, no one will be able to buy or sell unless they first receive a mark swearing their allegiance to the Antichrist. And it's... Verses like this that show us that the Antichrist will be a globalist. He will be a one-worlder. In fact, what he will try to do is erase the power of individual nations and make them submissive to overarching transnational, transfederal government. Now, again, let's compare that criteria to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, to my mind, is the exact opposite. He is someone that puts nation before world. In fact, one of his great campaign slogans was to make America great again. He didn't say he ran to make the world great again. He said, to, uh, he, said he ran to make America great again. He's the one that wants to build a wall around the United States of America, that's a national mindset, not a globalist mindset. He is the one that took us out of many of the globalist deals that were bad for the United States. He took us out of the Paris Climate Accord by saying what's good for Paris is not necessarily good for Pittsburgh. That's a nationalist type of decision. And he is also the one that took us out of the Iran deal. And so uh, sort of a globalist uh, treaty or deal of sorts. And so since the Antichrist will be a globalist and Donald Trump has acted as a nationalist, that's another way of debunking this idea that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. This takes us to number seven. The Antichrist will be a socialist. And maybe that's uh, too light a way of saying it. Perhaps the Antichrist will not be a socialist, but he will be a Marxist. And what that means is he will, believe, he will advocate an economic belief that the government is to control people economically from cradle to grave. People will have no economic freedom, economic liberty, the right to sort of create your own economic destiny through the free market system under the Antichrist's reign. The ownership of private property or the right thereof will be a thing of the past once the Antichrist gains control of the world. And you see that from passages like Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, which we read earlier, which indicates that no one can buy or no one can sell unless they can receive, unless they receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. In other words, if you don't receive the mark, you can't participate in the global economy. And this is talking about a cradle to grave nanny state 
or governmental control of an individual's life. They can't make economic decisions on their own. The Antichrist will believe in a planned, top-down, government-controlled economy over the entire face of the earth, which sounds a lot more like one-world socialism or one-world Marxism than it does free market capitalism. And again, let's compare that criterion to Donald Trump. Obviously, that doesn't fit Donald Trump. Since he has said over and over again in public forums that the United States, at least while he's in charge, will never become a socialist country. This takes us to an eighth characteristic of this coming Antichrist. When the Antichrist arrives one day after the restrainer has been removed, the Antichrist will be numerically identifiable. So this side of the rapture, it's sort of a guessing game as to exactly who the Antichrist is. Um, we can't know because as I, as I shared a little earlier in this presentation, there's a restrainer inhibiting this Antichrist. He can't come to power until the restrainer is removed. But one of these days, the rapture of the church will have taken place. The church's restraining influence will be removed, and the Antichrist will come forward. And once he comes forward, every single human being on planet Earth will know his exact identity because his identity can be calculated. And I believe that's the meaning of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. We've already read verses 16 and 17, but what does verse 18 say? In fact, let's start there with verse 17. It says, it says, he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. Now watch this, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in other words, his name will be converted to a number. And everybody in advance will know what that number is. And when his name converts to that number, he will be numerically identifiable. It won't be a mystery who he is. He'll be numerically identifiable to everyone on planet Earth. And the number is given in verse 18. It's a very famous uh, verse. Uh, even people that don't know Christ personally know this verse. It says in verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Now, what is this referring to? I believe it's referring to an ancient practice called gematria, it's sort of foreign to us in the 21st century, but back in biblical times, it was very common. If you look at ancient alphabets, whether it be Hebrew or Greek, every letter was connected to a number. And so you could literally spell out somebody's name and attach the right number to the right letter and add up the digits and the sum could be determined for every single human being on planet Earth. So every human being, when their name is converted to Hebrew or Greek, using this chart, adding the right number to the right letter, everybody's name could be reduced to a particular number. And I believe that that's what John is speaking of here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. When the Antichrist shows up, you'll be able to take his name, You'll be able to convert it into Greek. And all you have to do is attach the right number to the right letter, add up the numbers, and the Antichrist's name will spell out or will add up to the sum 666. Now, there are people today called preterists. Preterist comes from the Latin word meaning past or gone by. A preterist is somebody who basically believes the book of Revelation already transpired. And so preterists believe that you can take the name Nero 
and you can attach the right numbers to the right letter after you spell it out in Hebrew. And they think that Nero of the past was the beast because his number adds up to 666 using gematria. Now, what you'll notice here is the preterists have to do some cheating to make this work accurately. First of all, what they have to do is they have to use Hebrew. Greek won't work. And that's problematic because John was written to a Greek speaking audience. And then you'll also see what the preterists have to do. They have to throw in the name Kaiser or Caesar, which is the title of Nero, to get this to work. And that doesn't work either because John is very clear in Revelation 13, verse 18, that it will be the number of his name, not a title and not in Hebrew. So I believe that this coming one is yet future. And when he shows up following the rapture of the church, you'll be able to take his name, convert it into Greek, attach the right numbers to the right letter, add up the total, and it will be 666. And let me tell you something, Donald Trump's name, using this uh, formula, does not add up to 666. If it added up to 666 in any way, every website out there that thinks Donald Trump is the Antichrist, and as I mentioned earlier, apparently there's a lot of websites that apparently the progenitors of those websites think this way, they would all be using this. Aha, Donald Trump's name adds up to 666, and they would be trying to fudge numbers the way the preterists do to make it look as if, you know, Nero was the Antichrist of the ancient past. And so Trump's name simply does not add up to this um, 666, and that's another reason why we believe he can't be the future Antichrist. This takes us to our ninth uh, characteristic, if you will, of this coming Antichrist. He will be a worker of miracles. Notice, if you will, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and notice verse 9. You'll notice what it says here. It says, that is the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, whose coming is in accord with Satan. Now watch this. With all powers and signs and false wonders. Uh, the Greek word for power there is dunamis. The Greek word for signs there is simeon. The Greek word for wonders is teros. Now, when you take those same three Greek words, they show up in the ministry of Jesus Christ. I have all of the verses there on the screen, but Jesus Christ performed powers, dunamis, signs, simeon, wonders, Teros. And so when Paul uses the exact same three Greek words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, he's communicating something that the Antichrist's miracles will be just as real as those of Jesus Christ himself. Revelation 13, verse 13, talks about he, the false prophet, will perform great signs so that he even makes fire come out of heaven in the presence of men. That's the same kind of miracle that Elijah did in the Old Testament. Revelation 13 verse 14 says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which had been given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. So you notice that both the Antichrist and the coming false prophet will be workers of great miracles and signs and wonders. Now, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to have, particularly the Antichrist, spellbinding rhetoric. Revelation 13, verse 5 of the coming Antichrist says, A mouth was given to him speaking words and blasphemies. 
Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 says he will speak out against the Most High. So he will come and he will be performing signs and wonders. And as he's performing signs and wonders, he will have great oratorical or speaking ability. Now, it's interesting that when you study a book by Erwin Lutzer, a well-known evangelical Christian pastor, and the title of his book is called Hitler's Cross, he makes reference to a man that knew Adolf Hitler. And he says this about Adolf Hitler, this man that Erwin Lutzer here is referencing. He says, it was as if another being spoken out of his body. It was not a case of the speaker being carried away by his own words. I felt as though he himself with astonishment and emotion, I felt that he himself listened rather with astonishment and emotion to what broke forth from him. And Lutzer is talking about how Adolf Hitler, when he spoke and swayed the masses, it was, it was as if another was speaking through him. And we believe that that other speaking through Hitler was probably a demon. And I would envision the same scenario happening with the Antichrist. Once the restrainer is removed and Satan can do what he wants, he will actually enter the Antichrist, and the Antichrist himself will have great oratorical ability. In fact, it really won't be him speaking. It will be Satan through him. And this stumbles a lot of people because they don't understand exactly how miracles can happen if God is not authoring the miracle. Of course, God is a God of miracles, but as this slide shows you, and I wish we had time to look up all of the verses, but it shows you almost every verse in the Bible I could find where a miracle is occurring and God has nothing to do with it. So there is another source of miracle working powers in this world, in this universe called Satan himself. And that's why we as Christians are not to believe people just because they have an ability to perform miracles. First John chapter four and verse one tells us that we are to test the spirits because many false spirits or false prophets have gone out into the world. And unfortunately, we've raised a generation to believe that if a miracle happens, it must be from God. And they become sitting ducks, if you will, for this coming Antichrist, because the Antichrist will perform great signs and wonders. And let me take you now to my 10th and my final characteristic derived from God's word of this coming Antichrist. The coming Antichrist will try to usurp. He will be a usurper of Christ's position. One of the things we know about Satan is that Satan has always wanted to be like God. You see that there in Isaiah 14 and verse 14. In fact, that's what the word anti in the word antichrist means, that prefix. Some would say it means against God, but it's probably better understood as in the place of God. And that's what the antichrist is going to do. He's going to come along and put together a display of miracles that look so much like the things Jesus did 2,000 years ago that people will worship him in the place of the true Jesus Christ. And we notice in uh, the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 4, it says of this coming Antichrist, he exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. And so it's very clear that the Antichrist will come and he will try to usurp the place of Jesus Christ. You notice this chart I have on the screen 
I wish we had time to work our way through all of it, but it's got basically 20 parallels uh, between Antichrist and Jesus Christ. Um, just a couple. Uh, both, in both cases, they both claim to be God. In both cases, they are heralded by a forerunner. The list continues on in the second part of it. And actually, I said 20 similarities between Christ and the Antichrist. Let me correct the record there. It's actually 21. And one of the interesting parallels is the Trinity. You know, we believe in one God, monotheism, but we believe based on what the scripture teaches that that God has expressed himself in three separate personages, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that in the end times, you have an unholy trinity. You'll have Satan or the dragon, then you'll have the beast or the fall, uh, the beast or the antichrist, and then you'll have also the false prophet. Satan, antichrist, false prophet, unholy trinity, just like there is an authentic trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What is Satan doing? He is imitating God's program. He's imitating who God is. You know, it's interesting. You, you don't see any counterfeit $3 bills. <laughs> Why is that? Because there's no such thing as a $3 bill. But you do see counterfeit $5 bills, $10 bills, $100 bills, because there is such thing as a $5 bill, $10 bill, $100 bill. Satan counterfeits what is real. And in the process, what he's doing is trying through the Antichrist to fulfill his ultimate ambition of being like God. Well, I hope you found this uh, educational as sort of we wrap up our thoughts. Who is this coming Antichrist? We have at least 10 characteristics of him developed from different places of the scripture. He will be a person. He will be a Gentile. He will be a European. He will be lawless. He will be a persecutor of God's people. He will be a globalist. He will be a socialist. He will be one who is numerically identifiable once he arrives. He will be a miracle worker, and he will be a usurper of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just conclude very rapidly here with some good news because no doubt some of this may have depressed you. He, according to Revelation 13, verse 5, is only going to reign for 42 months. It says there, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. So he gets his day in the sun, and yet at the same time, his day in the sun will be eclipsed by the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which will last first for a thousand years and then forever. And we also know that this coming Antichrist will be defeated. Revelation 19 verse 20, as we shared earlier, describes him when Jesus returns, taking him and throwing him into the lake of fire. So yes, as Christians, let's study this coming Antichrist but let's not be overwhelmed by it. His day will come, but it is only allowed to be exercised under the sovereignty of God. And in the process, let's not forget Titus 2, verse 13, which says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter, folks, is I am not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus will return for his church before the Antichrist is even unveiled. And so let's be focused on him and living for him. And uh, thank you for, for listening. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this teaching that you've given us from your word on the subject of the Antichrist. Help us to be biblically accurate. Help us to not fall into sort of uh, specious schemes where we're 
trying to pin the tail on the Antichrist when the biblical data doesn't fit and help us to be aware of the coming Antichrist, but at the same time, help us also to um, be biblically balanced. And if anybody is watching that does not know you personally, I just pray that right now they would trust in you and you alone for salvation, faith alone in Christ alone, and consequently they come under the authority of you, the authority of your son, Jesus Christ, and they need not fear this coming Antichrist. I just ask that anybody listening that has never done that would do that now, even as I'm speaking. Thank you for this great work. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Mm. Well, thanks a lot, Andy. And that was uh, good to know that... Uh, President Trump is not the Antichrist <laughs> because I think I voted for him. Yes. Sir. So it's good to know that I didn't vote for the Antichrist there. So good information. But you know, there's other people that says, you know, in Revelation 13, the Antichrist suffers a mortal wound and it's like he dies and he rises again from the dead. And so some people are saying, well, that's what's happening to Trump. You know, he appears to have died and lost the election. But then through this appeal, he's going to come back again, like rising from the end. The whole world will be in awe of the Antichrist. So could that be a fulfillment of Revelation 13? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, I get that from, um, and it's sort of, there's sort of a debate, as you probably know about this, um, concerning the Antichrist's resurrection. Is it a real resurrection? And there's a lot of people out there that say no. I'm of the persuasion that it's an actually a real resurrection. Uh -huh. And the reason I think that is because the same Greek word, you know, that's used to describe Christ's resurrection in the same book, I think it's in Revelation 2, verse 8. I think the same identical Greek verb, zaao, uh -huh. uh, is come to life, is used in Revelation 13, verse 14. Wow. And, uh, and so the reason I, you know, and people say, well, how could you say that? Only Jesus can rise from the dead. And that's true. And there can't be a fake resurrection today, but this is a time period after the restrainer is gone. And the handcuffs are finally taken off Satan and he can do what he wants. And so I think even in that context, you know, he actually brings back the beast from the dead. So therefore what I'm trying to say is it's far more, you know, the Bible is saying a lot more about that than simply Donald Trump appearing to lose an election yeah. and uh -huh. then making a, making a comeback. Kind of like, and if that's the standard, I guess Richard Nixon could be the Antichrist too. Because he was politic, you know, he was politically dead when he lost the governor's race in California. Then he came back to be president. So it's just people that are, you know, they're really not interacting with everything the Bible says on the subject. Uh -huh. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Andy. And Andy's going to be back to talk about the Abraham Accords and the coming Middle East war. Uh, but we're going to take a 10 minute break here and then I'll be here to talk about COVID-19 and the coming plague. So take a break, go grab a drink, get something to eat, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. All right. We'll see you in 10 minutes.